Together, we seek to provide programming that is credible, objective, relevant, civil, and compelling. To change the world, we believe, one must first know the world. And you can learn more about what we do at worldmichigan.org. Tonight, we say a special thank you to our friends at Kent District Library, who annually partner with us to provide this free resource to the West Michigan community. With us this evening is Cheryl Kamiga, the Regional Manager of KDL's Kentwood and Gaines branches, and she's here to give us some words of welcome. Cheryl? Thank you, Michael. If I remember correctly, I believe our first partnership lecture series was held at the Kentwood Branch Library. And uh, the attendance at those lectures really exceeded all of our expectations. We are hoping to get back to in-house in uh, programming sometime soon. But in the meantime, it is really wonderful to be able to have these online programs that people can watch at their convenience. All of us who work at KDL really miss doing those in-house programs. But the good news is that all of our branches are open full service hours once again, and we are welcoming the public back in. We have 20 branches, a bookmobile that can be scheduled, and also our central services uh, center. Uh, those branches are in both rural and urban areas, and so serve a whole variety of different populations with different needs. Besides our regular collections and the browsing ability we now have now that we're open, we will continue to offer our curbside services. We also have free public computers, free Wi-Fi. We have free scanning and faxing. And for the rest of 2021, we are offering free printing and copying to the public as well. Our knowledgeable staff are ready and willing to help everybody wherever they're at and whatever their needs are to the best of our ability. And we really, really look forward to seeing everyone from all walks of life back in our libraries again. And I'll turn that back over to you, Michael. Thank you, Cheryl. And thanks to everyone at KDL who's made this such a joy to put on this series every year. After our panelists present this evening, there will be ample time for questions. You may type them into the YouTube comments section, or you may text them to 616-308-6560. Please exhibit civility to our guests and hospitality to others by asking respectful and succinct questions. We are pleased to have three local government leaders, Nicole Hofert, Stephen Kepley, and Melinda Isasi with us to talk about how responsive government contributes to community resilience. We are very grateful to them for their flexibility to engage us in this format. Our presentation tonight is titled Responsive Government Equals Community Resilience, and we welcome all three. We will start with Nicole Hofert from the City of Wyoming. Nicole is the City Planner for the City of Wyoming, where she manages planning and development projects as well as several citizen boards and commissions. Since joining the city in 2018, she has been instrumental in bringing community members together to help develop Wyoming Reimagined, the city's new master plan. Before her work in Wyoming, she was a private sector planner, advising municipalities on comprehensive and master planning after graduating from the London School of Economics with a master's degree in city design. Nicole, welcome. Thank you so much. It's so I'm so excited to be here tonight. I was honored to be asked to join. And you know, as I was thinking about tonight and thinking about what I'd like to talk about, I was thinking about resiliency in its early years. So I'm talking back when, as a planner, it was first kind of coming on the scene, and that was in the early 2000s. And at that time, resiliency was really about disaster mitigation. It was about responding to and and kind of being able to overcome disaster. So you think about 2005 and Katrina and, and tornadoes that, that swept through the South in those following years. And at that time, resiliency planning was more of a specific, almost built environment conversation. It was about putting generators on top of hospitals on the rooftops instead of at ground level. It was about installing glass 
uh, that could withstand the high winds that tornadoes experienced and, and you know, the, the materials that were thrown at hospitals during these events. And over time, it's evolved quite substantially. You know, in, in 2014, the Rockefeller Foundation started the 100 Resilient Cities trend, we'll say, and that kind of expanded the definition of what resiliency is for cities. Uh, and today, when we talk about resilient cities, we're really talking about economic <laughs> resiliency, we're talking about social resiliency, and we're talking about infrastructure. And I'm going to apologize. I have some four-legged friends in the background who are, I'm sure, barking at, at one of my neighbors. So, um, but it, it's so important to understand this evolution of the conversation because in my role as, as the city planner for Wyoming, you know, one thing that we talk a lot about and what was mentioned was the role in master planning or comprehensive planning and why it's so critical for cities to undertake this type of planning. For those not familiar, master planning is, is something that every community has to go through. It's a requirement uh, through the state. Uh, and in Wyoming, or in, excuse me, in Michigan, we, re we refer to it as master planning. But throughout the nation, it's more commonly referred to as comprehensive planning. And I actually prefer that terminology better because I think it really talks about what we're trying to achieve. You know, comprehensive planning, master planning, isn't just about looking at land use or zoning. Um, it's about looking at how your policies uh, and economic development in housing, in park, in, in park and open space development, uh, in infrastructure development uh, can all be used to provide vision to the city uh, to help achieve goals that ultimately make your community more resilient over time. Uh, it's these same practices that we saw laid out in Wyoming Reimagined, which is our newly adopted master plan. So this was a, a 16 plus month planning process. Um, we were lucky to do the bulk of our work prior to the COVID pandemic so that we were able to get out into the community, have one-on-one -on -one engagement sessions, and really work to understand what are the visions of our community members, what are the desires, and what policies do we need to recommend that get implemented to achieve these. So as you read through the Wyoming Reimagined document, our, our master plan, you won't see a chapter on resiliency specifically. There's no direct conversation that says to be resilient, do the following. That's simply not how planners talk about this anymore. As I mentioned, the conversation around resiliency has been since the early 2000s. It's, it's almost just become entrenched in the way that we practice. But what you will find are policies and economic development that support you know, diversified employment opportunities. Uh, you'll find conversations in our housing chapter about ensuring that we provide what's referred to as missing middle housing. Those are those housing types that fall in the middle of the spectrum. They're not your large multifamily complexes. They're not your single family homes. They're your, your town homes, your duplexes, your quadplexes, um, potentially even some more unique styles of housing like cottage courts where you have small homes orchestrated around a larger shared open green space. You know, before we were having this conversation, the dogs were not running around at all, and now they can't stop. So I do apologize. Um, but, but also in our master plan, you'll see conversations about transportation. Remember, it's a comprehensive document. So it's not, it's meant to talk about all facets of land use and transportation is one of those key conversations. It's talking about investments in bus rapid transit, BRT. It's looking at how you help create and solve that last mile problem. So when someone in your community hops on a bus and they go to their employment center and they come home, how do they get off that bus and walk that last half mile, a quarter mile, mile to their house? What does that look like? Are there bike routes in place? Are there safe and wide sidewalks? Is there good lighting? You know, these are all conversations that help lead to a resilient community. Guys? My apologies. Um, but more importantly, it, it goes beyond the, the specific talk about transportation in that world. It also talks about smart cities and what that means. So a smart city is something that first kind of came on the scene in 2010-ish, I'm going to guess. Um, I'll, that was probably an example earlier than that. But what smart cities have shown is that through transportation demand management, TDM, through different types of technologies, you can make cities more resilient, uh, more efficient in their in their um, practices. 
So kind of coming around to all of that, what does that all, what does that all mean for tonight's conversation? You know, when, when, when tonight's conversation was introduced, we talked about responsive government and community resiliency. And a master plan is, I believe, one of the best tools in my profession for helping to understand the community's desires and then start thinking strategically, what's your five-year plan, what's your 10-year plan, your 15-year plan? And I think it's really important to note that not every city is going to have the same types of policies. Of course, there are going to be broad generalizations. You know, everyone wants to understand affordable housing. Everyone wants to work to encourage diverse economic conditions, et cetera. But what works for one city may not work for every city. I think it's also important to note that some cities might arrive at that point sooner than later. Um, you know, a, an important conversation in many communities right now uh, is the integration of broadband uh, and also electric, you know, the electrocution of cars, the electrification of cars, shall we say, and what does that infrastructure look like? These are all conversations that communities are going to have at different levels, at different scales, and likely implement at different levels, all depending on the needs of their community. We want to be responsive to their residents, and that may mean that certain things have to progress sooner than others. But again, it's going to be different for every community. So if you haven't had an opportunity to uh, check out Wyoming Reimagined, this is my shameless plug. Uh, I do hope you'll check it out because I, I really believe that comprehensive planning is an important part of a community. And I think that it's important to understand and to verify year after year after year that the desires that you hear in your community um, are continuing to be implemented uh, as you work through that 5, 10, 15 year plan. Thank you. Well, thanks, Nicole. That is a great, great start. So I suppose London School of Economics, we could expect a, <laughs> a, a great foundational uh, presentation from you. Thank you so much for that. Appreciate it. We'll hear from now from Mayor Stephen Kepley. He is the mayor of Kentwood, and he's been so since 2013. He serves on, as chairperson of the Rapid uh, on the executive board of the Grand Valley Metro Council, the Waste to Energy Advisory Board, Solid Waste Management Advisory Committee, and he's the CFO of Kentwood's Young Life. And if that's not all enough, he's also president of the Kentwood Community Foundation. Uh, the mayor gained valuable experience while working for Kentwood as the director of engineering and inspections and a city engineer for 11 years, along with an additional 15 years in the private sector as in manufacturing design and construction. He has a degree in engineering from Virginia Tech, and we are very grateful to have Mayor Kepley with us. Stephen, welcome. Well, thank you so much. Um, from that introduction, I will tell you, my wife would say, I'm not bored. I'm very active, and um, I'll, I'll rest when I retire. <laughs> so uh, I want to approach uh, uh, this issue about resilient communities uh, in two ways. And one is to sort of introduce uh, the city of Kentwood's um, motto, and that is it's a, a community effort. And uh, we are not alone uh, as we are trying to lead and guide our different communities. So I wanted to, to just uh, inform the, the listeners of how we collaborate and I'm speaking on behalf of the city of Kentwood, but I know that Grand Rapids and Wyoming uh, use this collaboration effort uh, to, to really uh, be able to walk down this path, especially in difficult times like the pandemic. And, and I want to focus on sort of three levels of collaboration. One is at the state level, one's at a greater regional area level, and then one is at the greater Grand Rapids regional area. So at, at the very at the state level, uh, we are all members of the Michigan Municipal League. Uh, this uh, organization uh, consists of uh, 519 uh, cities and villages. There's a total of 533 cities and villages in, in Michigan, and uh, MML represents 519 of them. So a very large uh, group of, of uh, our cities and villages. And they, they primarily help us with legislation. They, they keep their eye on what's going on in Lansing and also in D.C. because laws affect how we do do things. Um, I don't know how many times that we planned and pivoted during this last year. Planned about, okay, how are we going to handle the, the pandemic? How are we going to do all these things? We're talking to one another, we're planning, and then all of a sudden something comes out of Lansing or DC and we have to pivot. So they concentrate on legislation on the state and federal level. They also educate us uh, on various facets of local governments and they train elected officials to how do you do this? You know, I don't, there probably are some, some classes you can take prior to be elected, but once you're elected, you know, how do you do this? And they really help uh, elected officials just know, know how it works. 
And the third the, the thing that they do primarily is uh, transformation issues, and they, they, they take them head on. Uh, things like uh, IDEA, uh, which is, uh, has to do with diversity, equity, um, accessibility, and inclusion. Uh, they also deal with um, uh, the, uh, helping the economic conditions uh, for the cities. How do you come vibrant cities and placemaking, that sort of thing. Uh, on the next level, is it's more of a, 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 a six-county area, and uh, it's our MPO, Metropolitan uh, Organization, and it's called Grand Valley Metro Council. And Grand Valley Metro Council represents 39 governing uh, communities, and it covers uh, six counties, including Kent, Ottawa, Allegan, Barrie, Ionia, and Montcalm. And uh, they their three main focus points is transportation. Uh, we get uh, quite a, a lot of money from federal government to do uh, the, uh, uh, road projects, and the MPO gathers, gathers together and they uh, identify and uh, organize that type of uh, funding for the different uh, units of, of government. Another big aspect of what uh, Grand Valley Metro Council does is, is a, uh, called Regis. It's the Regional Geographic Information Systems. So instead of each city owning their own one, the cities have, and the, uh, these governing agencies have come together. And basically by doing that, you, you do save a, a lot of money. So a lot of things that we do is to, to help the taxpayer money um, go a, a longer way. And the third thing that uh, the Grand Valley Metro Council concentrates on is environmental programming because our streams and our rivers flow through multiple units of government. And we all are concerned about keeping our, our waters clean and safe. And, and we also have things like the MS4 permit that we need to, um, to go through. And so when you're doing with a lot of with these, a uh, lot of technical aspects, we really wanna work together to talk with one voice, to do things very congruent, uh, no matter which side of the road you happen to live on. And then the, the, the um, more localized uh, group is called UM. You, you, you got to like the acronyms. UM, U-M-M-M, uh, Urban Municipal Mayors and Managers. And this is just the six cities. So Kentwood, Wyoming, uh, Grand Rapids, East Grand Rapids, uh, Walker, and Granville. We meet on a monthly basis. And we work together extremely well. Um, especially, I'll give you an example, the pandemic, how many, how many times did we have to make a decision? You can't go to your pandemic book and say, uh, this is how you do it. We're constantly talking to one another, trying to understand, you know, what is coming out of Lansing and how do we do this? And so we work extremely, extremely well with each other. Uh, we deal with all sorts of different types of, of issues and areas like uh, the 911 uh, emergency uh, call centers. Uh, we work on mutual contracts uh, with one another. We have mutual aid, so the fire departments help each other out. Uh, when, when before I was mayor, I was the building um, official and city engineer, and I had an awesome opportunity. Worked with my counterparts in the building inspections department, and you know we said we got we can do this better for our customers, and so we ended up um, uh, working with uh, our permitting applications concerning our trades, which is mechanical. Uh, plumbing electrical and our goal was to come up with the same application for permits so we're using the same nomenclature and the second goal was could we get to the same pricing so no matter where you were within the, the three cities um, we it was a common practice and we reached those goals and so you know just trying to be uh, customer friendly because you know when people have to come to city hall you want to make it as easy as possible and if we can be have a lot of similarities, it does definitely go a long way. So those are sort of the three areas that we've spent a lot of time and effort. And it does, I mean, we, we gain lots of value by this collaboration effort on the state, regional, and, and local area. So uh, with that, I'll just share a little bit about uh, Kentwood, um, you know, sort of the, the visions, missions, and core values. And um, and as I go through this, uh, you need to understand one thing that's really, um, I would say, unique to the city of Kentwood. So the city of Kentwood, of course, is home to Kentwood Public Schools, and uh, Kentwood Public School has uh, East Kentwood High School. And East Kentwood High School is the most diverse high school in Michigan and seventh in the nation. We have over, um, our students represent over 80 different countries and over 90 different languages. And it is an incredible blessing to have that diversity. 
there's such a value and benefit to having, you know, the world come to, to us. Um, the, 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 the learning experiences, the um, life lessons. Uh, I mean, you learn so much from, from people that, you know, have, have grown up in a whole different area, a whole different culture. And uh, we, are, we are truly blessed. Um, it's amazing to, to um, when, we, when you could before COVID, uh, be with the students, especially at East Kent High School. And, and, and the unity um, and, and the love that they have with, with each other. I, you know, I don't know how many times I thought, you know, these students can, can teach the world how to do this. Um, and, and so it's just been an honor to actually be mayor to represent this incredible diverse uh, community. Um, and, our, and our challenge is this, um, how do you bring unity to a community that has such diversity? And um, when I was, uh, knocking on doors uh, almost eight years ago. And every time I knocked on a door, a different person was behind that, someone that had a different story, a precious person. And I just remember after like the 10th house with uh, 10 totally different um, cultures and, and folks, you know, I asked that question, how do you do this? And sometimes when I ask a question, the answer comes to my mind. And this was the answer, it's simple. Uh, it's part of the greatest commandment. And part of the greatest commandment is love your neighbor as yourself. And I think that it's a simple word, but it's the most powerful word. I think the only way that we can create unity in a community is really to practice, to demonstrate love and love people that maybe don't look like you, talk like you, worship like you. Uh, we, are, we are called to love them. And that's just for me is, is key for a community to be successful. And so as a city, <clears throat> we try to bring our, 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 our residents together one way we do this is with free events. Um, who doesn't like a, a concert? And you know, bring your chair, bring your friends, and gather as a community for a free concert. And then you have food truck rallies, and you have all sorts of uh, different events throughout the year where we're trying to gather community together so that they might meet each other if they haven't met each other, to spend time with one another, to get to know each other, to bring community together. And so we do that with events, we do that with parks, we do that with trails. You walk on the trails and you meet all sorts of, uh, of people. And so that, you know, so part of our values, vision, mission and, and core values are the following. Uh, the vision is the city of Kentwood is a diverse Michigan community where people can find opportunity, safety, health and happiness. And, and part of that is that we, we wanna have a, a, a safe place to live a quality place to live, a place that is affordable. So that have all sorts of uh, uh, ranges of residential values. Those that uh, are, are maybe lower on the, the financial um, value versus up high and everything in between. Um, and so that's been a, a big discussion of us working with different organizations to provide housing that is affordable, uh, workforce housing, those type of things. Our mission is the city of Kentwood provides high quality service to foster a thriving community for all. I mean, part of that, what we wanna do is, um, is, is to provide a service and, and a quality service, but also do it at a price point that's affordable. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to say that, that Kentwood has the third lowest millage of, uh, of any city over 20,000 in Michigan, the third lowest millage. And so it, it, it takes a lot of effort to provide a high quality service at a price point that, that is affordable. And, and then of course, I'll, I'll stop with this uh, core values. I won't stop with this, got one more thing I wanna share with you. But core values, um, extraordinary customer service, integrity, equity, communication, leadership, all those are core. I, I wanna leave with this concerning just um, the diversity and the need for unity in our community. You'll hear a lot about, uh, we wanna be a welcoming committee. A community. We want to welcome those that call Kentwood home, and, and that's 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 great. We do, but more importantly, we want people to belong. It's a difference between welcoming and belonging, and that is our challenge as leaders here in Kentwood. Is yes, we, we are welcoming, but we need to take the next step, and we want them to belong. For me, I, I call it um, refrigerator rights. If you came to my house and I'm going to be a good host and I'm going to say, hey, what would you like to drink? And I would go get that for you. You want a, a Coke or milk or you want tea or coffee? What, what, and I'll go get it. Well, I'm welcoming you into my home. Well, when you become part of the family and you belong, 
uh, you have refrigerator rights. If you need something, there's a refrigerator, you go get it because you belong. And that's my goal. And our goal is to go from a welcoming community, uh, community to a belonging community. And that's gonna take a, a lot of hard work and strategic effort to make that happen. So I'll stop now, thank you. Stephen, thank you so much. I appreciated uh, that insight into the collaboration that our municipal governments do and, uh, and inspirational in how you talk about Kentwood's vision, thank you. Melinda Isasi is a second ward commissioner for the city of Grand Rapids, Michigan, which she has held since 2019. Uh, Melinda worked in human resources at Cascade Engineering, Herman Miller and Spectrum Health prior to that, and uh, most recently led the Source, an organization focused on reducing employment barriers and creating opportunities for mobility for employees that work for their general organizations. Um, just today, she started a new work. She is the new CEO of GROW, Grand Rapids Organization for Women. Congratulations to her for that. Melinda graduated from Grand Valley State University and has an MBA from Michigan State University. Melinda, welcome. Appreciate your being with us. Thank you. Thanks so much for the invitation. And, um, you know, I think what COVID has allowed us is to get people in the room that sometimes our calendars in the past might not have allowed that to happen. So I'm happy to be here representing the city of Grand Rapids, a city where I was born, where my great grandparents came here in 1949 as migrant farm workers and settled and were able to build a middle class life for my grandparents and my parents. And so my family has a long history in Grand Rapids. This is the only place I've ever known, except for when I went to Allendale to go to Grand Valley. So, and it is an honor to be the first Latina elected to the city, to the city commission here in Grand Rapids. Um, that was in 2019. So that wasn't that long ago. And when we think about, you know, our Nicole and Mayor Kepley have talked about, you know, diversity and belonging and, you know, I think the for me, it's really the representation matters because we we want all of those things, but when we have when we have different points of view and different different representation, we get a little bit closer to understanding um, different perspectives, and especially in city government, that um, you know, being the first not just Latina but Latino, I worked on Commissioner uh, Sunita Lanier's campaign. She was the first Black woman elected to commission in 2013. Again, not that all that long ago. I never imagined, I actually ran for office, um, other positions, wanted to be a library board commissioner in Grand Rapids. That was my first election, GRCC board of trustees and the school board. And I lost all of those elections. I finally won in the biggest really election of my life when I ran uh, for second ward city commission to fill the seat that Ruth Kelly was vacating due to term limits here in the city of Grand Rapids. So when I settled in, in January of last year, I thought, okay, I can breathe a little bit. All the hard work of campaigning, the nights that you spend going door to door, talking with people, my husband essentially being my campaign manager, I thought I can have a little breath and I can take a little time. And little did I know that I would only have six meetings in person before we went into this virtual world of governing and had my first year in office be focused on a global pandemic, an economic recession, and uh, a, a call to end systemic racism in all facets of our of our life. And so I'm writing a journal. <laughs> so I know everything that we talk about, because I hope to look back on this time. And I always knew that it was a privilege, but even more so it just feels like a, a major responsibility. And I feel um, just feel very uh, lucky to be here in this spot and know that that luck was really by those who helped me get here and, and other leaders around the table. So when we think about Grand Rapids, it's important, I think, to know, you know, we're a city of 200,000 people um, in our wards. We're divided by a ward system. So there's three wards. I represent the second ward, which is really considered the northern part of the city of Grand Rapids. About 76,000 individuals live in each one of our wards. And um, I've actually lived in every single ward in Grand Rapids, but I love to call the second ward home. It's been my home with my husband and I for the last 12 years. Um, it's important to note that our city commission roles are you know, part-time positions. We hire a city um, CEO, our city manager, Mark Washington, who came to us from Austin, um, Texas, and who has a wealth of experience as a 
you know, as um, a, a civil, a long time civil um, service individual, understanding how municipal government works, working with elected officials and working in uh, coordination and conjunction at the national, state and, and local level. So I think it's important for people to note that because I always think you're a city commissioner, you can just go and decide and do whatever you want. No, that's not how local government works. You really are working as a team, you know, hopefully to support your city manager to ensure that they are doing the best job and not engaging in those day to day operations of the city, but really providing that oversight, that guidance, the policy perspective, the legislative priori priorities, and as I told the team earlier, reviewing the first book of our budget that we're gonna to start tomorrow. Um, and so May will be all about uh, reviewing the budget at hand and making those decisions about where our tax dollars should be expended in this city. Um, so when we, when we talk about that at that level, I always like to point out to people, it's not just my vote and whatever I wanna do, I can do. It's really coordinating and connect, connecting with your fellow commissioners, the mayor and that city manager to work in that collaboration and that spirit of supporting your city. You know, I, I loved the topic when this came to me um, as an opportunity that Erica presented, because this idea of resiliency is one, you know, Nicole gave a really good background of how it emerged and, you know, economic development in our cities and communities, really in our social circles and primarily in communities of color, there has been a, a sort of a negative connotation in recent years around the idea of resiliency and that, you know, when we think about resiliency, it's the ability to recover from something that is negative or bad in a quick or easy way. Um, or I think it's even defined as toughness. And so, you know, the commentary I would say in the, the social circles is, why do we have to be resilient? Why do different communities, primarily women, people of color, black and brown indigenous people, refugees, undocumented have to be so resilient? Um, you know, when we think about in our community, we know that there are many individuals who are living here undocumented, who did not, who were not able to access things like the federal stimulus. Uh, I was very proud of the work that our city government did to support what was called La Lucha Fund to help support families that are living and working and paying other taxes in the city of Grand Rapids who did not have access to the stimulus money. And so I think it's really important to kind of say, I think resiliency, I loved the fact that it was community resiliency because it wasn't focused on the individual. The resiliency is not just to that individual family member who may be undocumented and living on our west side of Grand Rapids, whose kids go to GRPS. It's not just about the individual who is you know, trying to have you know, upkeep with their property taxes. It's not that individual um, who is trying to find their first home in the city of Grand Rapids and is finding it difficult because of the increases caught the increased cost to housing. So for me, I'm like, I will say yes, because they put an important word in front of resiliency, which is community. And that as uh, municipal government, we need to think about sort of how local government was created. Um, when it was created, it was not created to be this idea, I believe, to be welcoming, to be affirming, to, to recognize the diversity. It was really to, I believe, protect um, individuals' rights and particularly land and even in our city of Grand Rapids to disenfranchise individuals to have the opportunity, you know, to share their thoughts, um, to engage in city government. Uh, we used to have many wards, it's now into three wards. I won't get into the thoughts around that. Um, but this idea of how do we really engage, you know, community overall. So for the city of Grand Rapids, we have four legislative priorities. And I thought that that would be best to overview because again, at our role, I am not, um, responsible for the oversight of our biodigester um, that we are <laughs> engaging with that some have probably heard about because it is, um, it's an investment, right? It's an investment into how do we turn our waste into energy and trying to view how does the community become more resilient and understand the climate crisis that we are facing in this country. So for us, it's really a focus on our fiscal uh, responsibility. So making sure that we have appropriate revenues coming into our city. Over the pandemic, we um, lost a significant amount of our um, income tax um, into the city because of the fact that people were working at home. So if they were working at home and they were no longer working in the city of Grand Rapids, as one of 26 cities in the state, 
that was revenue that was lost to us and really working um, at the state level to try to find a better solution. Um, you know, investment in the long term in things like our social districts that we've seen as a way to help support um, our hospitality and restaurant businesses so that we can be an all season city. Um, you know, they do it in Europe, but for whatever reason, we don't like walking and we don't like being cold. Um, but in other places, it is just very typical and we want to change that, as well as just increasing and recognizing more equity in our revenue sharing as it comes from the state. Certainly a focus on the increase in housing, uh, both, you know, Nicole and Mayor Kepley talked about that. And so um, last commission meeting, we had a focus on um, our housing fund, which uh, we will uh, reopen, we will look to add some additional dollars to that. There are dollars that are generated by different development that many developers and other projects are um, opting in to you know, put forth there. Hopefully with our Recovery Act dollars, there will be an opportunity to additionally invest, but also just policy pieces um, like you know, our Kent County Land Bank uh, dissolved right before I became a commissioner. And so really working on legislation to say a city that is located in a county that doesn't have a have a county land bank, we should be allowed to do something like that to be able to add to our housing stock here in our city. Certainly a focus on public safety and what does it really mean to keep our community safe. This is a priority for me because I think it's absolutely tied into economic development. We need to look at prevention measures. Um, why do people engage? Why are they susceptible um, to you know, engage in activity that, you know, is, is illegal, it could potentially be violent. Um, for me, a focus is certainly on um, uh, the reduction of uh, domestic and gender uh, violence that happens in our community. And then lastly is our river restoration. We are poised to have this, you know, immense river restoration in the coming years. A lot of investment is happening right now. Um, our economic development department released a report last week. Um, I think there was like a 68% increase in the amount of uh, micro businesses that have been able to engage with the city. So then hopefully they'll be able to bid on business that um, comes from this, you know, catalytic once in a generation, maybe once in a century investment that's going to happen here on our riverbanks. So the legislation piece is just so key because the word priorities was never meant to be plural. Um, if anybody's ever read the book, Essentialism, uh, it was always meant to be one word. But as a city, we have to balance all of those interests, those of our residents, those of our other partner municipalities in the state, our businesses. And, you know, uh, I, I think increasingly, uh, you know, those who are looking to potentially come into the city, you know, as we look at how work is going to be disrupted, it's going to change how, how education will be disruptive and changed. And so I think the city of our future is one that absolutely has to be resilient, it has to be agile, and it has to find ways to include resident voice. So lastly, I will say that the ways that we've tried to do that is um, by making sure that we're not just saying we're open for business and come and see us. When people are having to experience resiliency in their own life, probably the last thing they're going to do is log on to a city commission meeting at seven o'clock in the evening and hear us approve our consent agenda and then listen to two public hearings uh, about, you know, uh, uh, different developments that might be happening. Um, I did, but I was a little nerd <laughs> as it related to, I love West Wing, I love city government. I know there's like a new podcast that Michigan Radio has where you can actually listen to the minutes and you can listen to the active audio of our city commission meetings. But most people aren't going to do that. They're living their lives, they're trying to engage with their economy, they're taking care of their families. And so for me, and I think, and I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say our city government is not okay with just saying we're just open and you come to us. Um, but trying to define the community engagement tools that we use, we have a new um, communications leader that's also come from Austin. Um, very excited about his leadership, engaging in things like flash vote to get a sense in a very short term, what are people's opinions about the topics of the day. And so the first one we did was around public safety. We have a neighborhood match fund, which allows residents and organizations that aren't necessarily official to be able to access dollars for ideas that they have in their own neighborhoods around literacy, food justice, public safety, and just overall economic um, engagement. And then certainly being a um, 
with the federal dollars that are coming from our community development block grants, um, looking at the different organizations who are going to expend those dollars and really see what those maximizing impacts can be. And then of course, in the just a few years ago, having a, a parks millage that was approved overwhelmingly in our city, and I think was really a, a strong foresight into this year of the pandemic where we were in our homes, but really looking for ways to engage in public spaces in a safe and healthy way. So for me, this, this first couple of years has been like nothing I've ever expected. I have cried behind my computer screen. I'd had people threaten me. I've had people praise me. I've had, you know, my family ask me, why are you doing this? But I've never stopped believing that this is absolutely the place that I am supposed to be during this time. And so thanks for, for hearing more and listening to me talk about Grand Rapids, the city that I love. And um, I'm excited to engage in the rest of the dialogue this evening. Oh, thanks so much, Melinda. Appreciate that. And I, I think all your, your communities do, uh, I think, model going out to residents rather than expecting all the residents to come to you. I think that's a marvelous way of talking about responsiveness of community government. Um, you can ask a question of our panelists by going to the comments section of the YouTube uh, broadcast that you're listening to and type them in, or you can text them to 616 308-6560. And uh, I'd like to get things started with panelists to, to talk about, uh, you know, flexibility uh, in this time of COVID. I mean, that's been, that's been the, the big extra uh, challenge that all of you have had. Um, how do municipalities plan for the long term, knowing that they have to adapt based on new state and federal laws? And there's been a lot of them regarding COVID in particular. Um, and um, other uh, things that change. What has COVID particularly taught you uh, about the ways municipalities can stay flexible and adaptive even while managing you know, a, a strategic plan or a, a long range plan? And if anybody wants to take that on to start and you're all welcome to, to uh, give some reflection on your experience in your city. I guess I'll start. It's you plan and pivot. That's what it is. Plan and pivot. So, you know, we have uh, plans. We have five year, 10 year, 15. When we're looking at purchasing uh, equipment, we actually uh, go out 20 years because you know you're going to need a fire engine uh, and police uh, cars and, and DPW uh, trucks and equipment. So, we, we plan equipment for 20 years. So, what COVID did is some of those plans, not really the purchasing, but uh, uh, some of the studies we wanted to do, some of the um, uh, planning for some of our parks uh, have, were put on hold uh, because, you know, we are a bit, very uh, fiscally responsible. We have a budget. We're not going to go over budget. And there are a lot of concerns about uh, what would be the revenue uh, incomes during this year of COVID. And so, uh, like uh, Kenwood, like many other uh, cities and governances, uh, we, we um, were conservative in our revenue assumptions. And so some of these uh, programs and plans were just would put on hold, while others were new. For instance, we weren't planning before COVID to put in free Wi-Fi all over the city. But guess what happened? COVID happened, and we now have free Wi-Fi in 15 locations throughout the city. So, you know, COVID has been very difficult, right? There has been loss of life, um, but there also have been some wonderful things. And one is, um, these like this program of, of free Wi-Fi for our residents, especially our students who can't afford it, you know, going to our parks and, and to some of our, uh, our buildings where they can log on it has been such a wonderful thing. The other is just um, people um, really um, fall in love with the outdoors again and, and the support for our parks and our trails. Um, and and uh, we've started programs because of COVID uh, park stewardship and people are, are, are I think, more engaged um, in the outdoors because um, of the limitations that we had on, on the inside of buildings that we could be outside and have safe uh, separation. And so a lot of positive things, you know, happened because of COVID. I'll, I'll add to that, that, you know, when we talk about being agile, uh, you know, zoning codes are very restrictive and there isn't a, an easy way to overlook anything that's prescribed in the code. You know, there's a reason why it's there. 
Uh, and COVID really challenged us to think outside of the box. I, I know I'm not alone. I know our, our you know, Wyoming, or excuse me, Kentwood and Grand Rapids also had to, had to think outside of the box. And one of those things that we all had to think outside of the box on is when your restaurants have occupancy limits that don't allow them to continue to operate, how as a community can you help them? Because there are, there are only, there's only so much from a municipal perspective you can do. And one thing we were challenged with is how do we make it so that outdoor seating is an easier thing to have done, that it's more expansive than it was done before. And not just outdoor seating for restaurants, but you know, you think about your yoga studios or your workout facilities and you know, what types of outdoor activities can you permit and allow in parking lots, you know, on the sides of buildings where you may not have allowed them before, but because of COVID and the challenges, you really had to start thinking about ways to help your residents be successful. So I'll leave it with that. Yeah, I'll add, um, certainly we talked a little bit about social districts and our zones and um, you know, in the city, we have what are called corridor improvement authorities. So I serve on our North Corridor Improvement Authority. So these businesses who already volunteer their time, they're engaged in the work of the, the you know, bringing business and, and engagement into their particular corridors. Um, but what I found is it's almost like a common mission, right? Like, like the vaccine rollout is how do we step up to this occasion and try to do more? Um, certainly, I just want to thank our, our city staff that were so pivotal during this time. You know, many who I think um, a few months ago we had a, a call for just what are the ideas that you had about now that we have some of these restrictions, sort of some that could be arbitrary or some that are just like this is the way that that municipal government is. What are the ideas that you have? And so our city manager and his deputy an assistant manager work to make sure how do we capture that because oftentimes it's those individuals in those seats who are just saying I don't know why we do this but um, getting their ideas and capturing that and then also you know not the best thing that I wanted to talk about in 2020 but was the amount of homicides that we had in the city of Grand Rapids the the highest amount it was certainly um, something that as we watch that happen, you know, why is this happening? How is this happening? And I do believe that it is hopefully a blip in the, the realities that people were facing economically, mentally, the trauma, the secondary trauma that individuals have. And so what I believe it did push is tomorrow on our fiscal, fiscal committee agenda, and then it'll go to our consent agenda, is an approval to accept a contract with Cure Violence and an interrupting system to really get at um, you know those who are engaging in violence acts, particularly around you know around guns, and how do we interrupt that? How do 